Okay, we have a very special evening this evening. Normally, well, we've spoken over the many years here, prehistory of all the things about Gondwana, etc., etc., then ancient history about Plettenberg Bay and the rest of the world. And now tonight we have modern history. And modern history is very interesting because we were all there when it, when it happened. Okay, and tonight our speaker is Lee Dunn. Now, Lee is, we were just discussing it, uh, we would call him a person of colour, okay, uh, one of those things. Colourful <laughs> and, and Lee told me that he's 40 years old plus vet. <laughs> now, Lee was born in Plettenberg Bay, so you know, there are very few of the people here. Anyone else born in Plettenberg Bay here? Put your hand up. Oh, they were okay, so we've got some other people of colour. <laughs> okay, um, he's a third generation of the of, um, of a person uh, born in Plettenberg Bay. He's a teacher by profession, okay, and most of the time at the moment he does private tutoring, right? He's travelled the world. He's quite an uh, erudite person, having travelled the world. But he has a special passion, okay, about culture and history, and particularly involving Plettenberg Bay. So I call upon uh, Lee to give you a talk on most interesting subjects. Thank you very much. From my side, good evening everyone. And thank you once again for the good response. Um, thank you for being here. I also believe it's a good subject. My, um, not to put you off, but my talk could be a little bit long. I'm gonna try and cut here and there and, and I'm gonna try and feel the crowd, but um, I hope you enjoy this evening. Um, I've already been introduced. I'm Lee Dan. Um, I'm going to try and keep it a little bit witty in between because it could be quite a serious subject. So let's um, enjoy it, although it's a serious subject. And um, yeah, I'm going to read most of my notes because I don't want to miss anything important. I feel that the timing of this presentation could not be better. Firstly, because we're currently celebrating the centenary of um, Nelson Mandela's birth this month. Um, there's a march in Plit as well on Saturday. And secondly, because currently in our country and our politics, there's so much controversy and so much discussion around the topic of land reform. So. If you look at the topic of what I'm going to talk about this evening, namely, the colored folk of Plett, how they were moved from the CBD by the Group Areas Act number 41 of 27 April 1950, and a few related anecdotes, then it also tells me that it's about land reform. Every time our state president, Sir Ramaphosa, opens his mouth, it's about land reform. You know about the riots that's been happening in our own town. Still, people might not be happy. What's it all about? It's about land. It's about land issues. It's about land reform. So that's why I told you at the beginning that it's a very sensitive issue. It's a very sensitive topic. But I believe that it couldn't happen. This presentation couldn't happen at a better time. Um, you're going to be allowed to ask a few questions afterwards if time allows. And I'm very happy that I probably won't be able to answer all your questions because I didn't live in the time of the, of the apartheid and the 1950 Group Areas Act. It's things that's been passed on to me and my family. Um, we're very fortunate in that sense that um, we have a lot of documented history. Um, as I was introduced now, I'm a third generation Plitt resident and I feel very honored. Um, by the way, Yesterday, just yesterday, the 11th of July 2018, I was a guest at a book launch at the Table restaurant in Plitt. This is the book, Bastards or Humans, The Unspoken Heritage of Colored People, Origin, Identity, Culture and Challenges by Dr. Reuben Richards. So I don't believe in coincidence. I believe that everything happens. 
the way it's supposed to. So yesterday, this book launch happened. And yesterday evening, I had the privilege of going through some of his notes in this book and adding it to my presentation here today. So I believe it's just very special. I'm going to put it to one side for a while. Yeah, that book says, The Unspoken Heritage of the Colored People in South Africa. That's the intro, as I, as I told you. The Colored Folk of Flint, how they were moved from the CBD by the Group Areas Act, number 41, of 27 April 1950, and a few related anecdotes. I'm sure you won't be able, you won't all be able to see that photograph over there. But let me tell you something about that photo as well. The little boy with the blue on, it's me, obviously. My sister next to me. Um, my granny Bertha on your right, with the white. And my mom, Joey, on your left. So, I was about four or five years old there, and we're sitting, if I have to take you to Plet, how it looks today, we're sitting on the staircase in front of Fushini's. That used to be the old Lion's Hall. Mm. But before it was the Lion's Hall, it was the school where my grandfather was the school principal. And we're sitting on that staircase in front of the Lion's Hall over there. Let's go to the next slide. Just one or two photos, and that's the family. Um, that has been published in yesterday's Sea Express as well. My granny, the family, the Dunn family, and the Harker family of Petersburg Bay, and I'll tell you how we fit in and how we are one family, or we became one family. Um, one small mistake they published yesterday in Sea Express is that they mentioned that Bertha is my, gra my mom. My mom is not Bertha, Bertha is my dad's mother. So my dad's mother was the owner of that huge property in Kloof Street in Pleasantburg Bay. Let's start with the time before the Group Areas Act. The Harker families in Plet owned most of Plet Central. Church Street, Crescent Street, Kloof Street. And then also a few of the families owned places at Harkerville and in Purkis, as I'll explain to you a little bit later. The well-known Nguni restaurant and the White House Theatre, that was built by Thomas Harker, family member. And I have contact with his sons, Colin and Finley, who settled in, Ab in Albertinia at the moment. So Nguni restaurant is an original Harker home. The White House was not there, but the restaurant in front was their humble family home, as it still stands today. It's one of the very few plet buildings that were not taken over by huge contractors who tried to change things so humble and beautiful into modern structures and look totally out of place in our little town. The parking area below Zanzibar Lounge. I'm sure you probably know what, you know, because I'm still in, I think it's Crescent Street, so I'm still in Crescent Street. Zanzibar, there's a hairdresser there as well. Um, so there's a parking area. That parking area and then the Chinese shop be below that used to belong to Reginald Carollison. And he's the husband of one of the Harkers as well, Dora Harker, that I'll tell you about soon. The little building below the Chinese shop in Crescent <coughs> Street, where Colin Kemp had a physiotherapy place. Um, later it became a car dealer, and I think it's an estate agent now. But that used to belong to Elizabeth Bertha Harker, my great-grandmother. So she's the mom of my granny Bertha. That used to belong to them. Mm -hmm. Alberto Backpackers, I think you know where that is, in Church Street. Checkers, you get checkers. Checkers was the old school, I'll tell you about that now. And then Alberto Backpackers used to belong to Michael Miller, um, husband of my grandmother's younger sister, Gwendolyn Harker, who got married to Miller. Those are just a few starting off examples of how the Harkers owned most of Plet. 
and of course most of Harkovar, starting with Captain Robert Charles Harker in 1823. Um, for time, I might not go into many of the details, but I'll go more into my family details and a few other things that you might find more interesting than going back to where he was born in Ireland in 1823 and all those kind of things. My grandfather's farm on the N2 at Harkerville, you, um, it is the place between the Potter and Strombolas. Today it's called De Hotes, and it, pro and it provides guest accommodation. That was taken from us as well. The rest of Plent Central, which did not belong to the Harkers, belonged to a few isolated families, which I'll mention a little bit later. Um, there were six white families living in Plint, Central. Um, okay, let, let's get back to the word white. We said it just so in a jokey way that I'm a colorful person. I don't care what you call me, you can call me a colored person, because this evening we are here about, historic, it's, it's about a historical talk. And if that is the way people mentioned it, it's okay, we can do so, just for tonight. So, um, there were six white families who lived in Plint. Luckily, I didn't live that, that time, so you can't ask me the names of those families. I'm sure you're very interested in knowing who they are. I don't know who they are. But um, that's been documented by Patricia Storer. The rest of the town belonged to government. For example, the Lookout Center that used to be a police station. And the rest of the CBD, which did not belong to government, belonged to the St. Peter's Anglican Church Diocese. I'll explain that to you now as well. That's why Formosa Place in Main Street has the name Formosa Place, because the St. Peter's Anglican Church belongs to the parish of Formosa, and they still have lots of property. So they, they receive their, mon their monthly income from the rentals um, from that property. Uh, the wooden structure behind Formosa Place and behind Checkers Building, which we all know as the new hospice charity shop. I, I think it's the hospice charity shop. It opened in early 2018, um, now, in early 2018. That was one of the classrooms where my granddad taught. Um, my mom is here to back me up. Um, mom, I just want you to come forward quickly, please, and come stand next to me. Let, let's, let's just do it a bit differently. You see, she, she's the one sitting there next to me with a white one. And this is her. She's 73 years old now, um, still living in Plate. And my mom is just here to back me up. So the wooden building, the wooden classroom, was one of the classrooms that you taught in. Uh, which is yeah, now. Afternoon, I was an afternoon session for a while, three years, and I taught in, in that wooden building. But uh, before that time, I there where Fushini is today. When I go into Fushini, I get a tear in my eye to go up because I've been teaching six years in that class where Fushini is now. And then through the group areas in 1969, the 1st of July, we started for Mosa in your guys. You must never give an ex teacher a microphone <laughs> because they're never going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> The other, the other reason why I also called my mom forward is because, you know, we, we have to have fun anyway. And I'm going to show you that my mom was standing next to me now, so obviously I look like my dad. I look like the down side of the family. Um, that's why they call us colored, because we're all different. We, we all look very different. The history of the original Dunn families of Plettenberg Bay. Um, I'm not going to bore you with the history of um, John Dunn, where we all started, where the Dunns, the first Dunns in South Africa started off, because that's also published as a special feature in the Plit Culture and Heritage magazine by Plit Tourism. Um, I brought a few of those magazines over here, just if you're interested in perhaps taking one if you didn't read my history, which is in there. Well. You'll read in there that John Dunn was survived by 23 Zulu wives. 23. Yes, 23. <laughs> and he's a Scotsman. He's a Scotsman. And 79 children. Oh, wow. It beat Jacob Zuma. 
and still they call Jacob Zuma the father of the nation. So I just wonder if John Dunn knew the names of all his 79 children, of which one was my great granddad that I'm going to tell you about now. According to research, John Dunn's children were scattered all over South Africa. They called him the White Chief of Zululand because he came in from Scotland and he just took it just took wives and had children there. So they, they had a lot of respect for me. They, were, they called it the White Chief of Zululand. My great-grandfather, Michael Dunn, one of his sons, one of the sons of John Dunn, was born in 1851. Um, and he accepted a railway job in Somerset West. Okay, now it's getting a little bit more exciting because we, we, we're already starting to get closer to Plet. And I won't take 40 minutes to get there. <laughs> Michael Dunn was obviously of mixed descent half Scottish and half Zulu. So I think, what a handsome guy. <laughs> he married Elizabeth King. She was a colored woman from Heidelberg in the Western Cape. We have photographs of her. She was a beautiful lady, so we don't know her background. It could possibly be the Indonesian or Malaysian slaves. Possibly. And that is who they are, that I'm going to tell you about now. The, the dad, the one with the beard, he is Michael Dunn, that I told you about now. So he is the son of John Dunn, my great-grandfather, Michael Dunn. And then, if you can see clearly on the picture, the boy right at the back, furthest to your right, that is my grandfather, Michael William Dunn, <laughs> the one who worked in Plet. So if you look at his dad, if you look at the dad, you can see he's, he's more light skin, as I told you now, half Scottish, half Zulu. But if you look at my granddad, the one further back on the right, you can see he's, he's darker. Um, and then you can see his mom, a colored lady, which we think the Malaysian slaves and the Indonesian slaves were the, 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 the influence there. <laughs> So they were the Dunn family of Somerset West, um, 1905, and my granddad was 14 years old that year, in 1905. My great-grandfather, the dad here on the picture, he died tragically in a um, crash, a um, railway crash where he worked, and his wife also died at a young age. I don't know why, I think maybe financial stress and other things. They had, um, I didn't, didn't write that down, they had seven children, I think. But, but it's also published in that little magazine if, you, if you'd like to take one. Um, so the children grew up orphans. And they were reared by a white family in Somerset West. You see, it's getting interesting now. No hearts, a white family. There goes the Dan Heritage. The Van Vank family from Somerset West. My granddad, who was one of those orphans, was the only one who got educated. All the, other sibling, all the other siblings went to work as taxi drivers and business people in order to survive. Okay, that's my granddad. And at the tender age of 21, after completing his seminary studies at the Zonneblum, the Zonneblum College in Cape Town, Michael William Dunn got his first job at the Diocese of Formosa and Pittenberg Bay in 1912. That was the time that only six white families and a clergyman, namely Reverend Bridge, lived in Plitt, other than the colored families who lived there. Between 1906 and 1910, the only building on the island called Beacon Island was an old shed in which the locals kept their whale boats. It was late in 1910 that the Norwegians arrived in Plitt in seven whaling ships fitted with guns. They then built a factory on Beacon Island and three other buildings. Dunn was English speaking. Most of the other colored families um, were Afrikaans speaking, which is a little bit of a mix between Dutch and Malaysian if you've done research in Africa about how Afrikaans came about. For example, the, the real Netherlands Dutch language, you will not get the Afrikaans word Bayer. The real word is feel, 
Phil is the Netherlands, I was in the Netherlands as well, and um, that's where I learned, you don't get the word Bayer, Bayer Danke, it's a Phil Danke, Netherlands, because Bayer is a Malaysian word, and that's where Afrikaans originated from. Um, he became the first colored school headmaster of the first multiracial school in Plettenberg Bay, which was started in 1901 by Bishop Bull of the Anglican Diocese. You know, down at um, the Old Rectory Hotel, Bull Street, Bishop Bull. I just want to divert a little bit and tell you something else. Can I tell you quickly how it happened that I'm here this evening and how I'm presenting this talk? It's a long story. I'm going to start by 15 August 2017. That was the day that the old Rectory Hotel opened in Plett. Before that, a friend of mine, Ewald Stander, told me about that. So I got email addresses. I contacted the, the builders, the owners, um, and they were not interested in my history. I told the old Rectory Hotel that I have a long and rich history, and my grandfather taught them. Because before the school moved to Main Street, it was there where the spa building of the Old Rectory Hotel is now. It was in Bull Street, that was also a classroom which they only renovated two years ago for the hotel. I contacted them and they were not interested in my history. I then decided I'm contacting Sea Express last year. Neither were they interested in my history because I told them it's the opening of the new Old Rectory Hotel and I have lots of historical info about that which I can share with you. Neither were they interested because they told me your info is going to take our whole newspaper. That's how much info it is. And we're dependent on advertisers. Yeah. Then, and you know, I don't easily give up without a fight. Then I decided, and I spoke to my dear friend who is here this evening, Ruby Chetty. Where's Ruby? R Ruby, where are you? Can I see you, please? Oh, she's hiding right at the back. Okay. Lady in red. Lady in red. Ruby Red. I spoke to my dear friend Ruby Chetty and she told me, you have to speak to Mike. I got hold of Mike, can't he? And I spoke to one or two other people and they said you must get hold of Leslie Mullins. I went onto Facebook, I got hold of her, I got an answer from her. And that's how a year later, almost a year later, we're here to share a very rich side of the history of our town, which will now be documented thanks to the Van Pettenberg Historical Society. Yes, as I said, the spa building of the old Rectory Hotel was the school where my granddad taught from 1912 to 1942, when they moved to Main Street. My cousins, um, Lynn and Des and Karen from Canada, were here last year to come and see the old Rectory Hotel, where it opened, to see my granddad's old school being renovated, and after it was renovated. I was told by so many locals who went to school there, how the school children would go and play on the beach during intervals and run back when hearing the school bell. One of them was Magda Johansson telling me about her mom, Sally Johansson, who went to school there. Another one is Iris Dixon, she still lives in Plett. And when the school had a function or a special event, the children would receive their refreshments on Hobie Beach during school time. Wow. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Then in 1942, the school moved to Main Street Plate, where Fushini is. I added a little bit of info, so this is not documented, this is my info I'm going to add to you now. Imagine a school in Main Street, with noisy kids running all over the road all the time. Plate Primary thinks they have it bad, with, with two shopping malls next door. So I can just imagine 1942, the noise, because you, you've been used to the freedom of having school on the beach and now you structured you in Main Street with cars, trucks, everything. Those kids in Main Street. Yeah. The school in Main Street became the Lions Hall in 1969. We all know what the Lions are. They are a society like the Rotary Club. So it was uh, in the Lions Hall, they did many school concerts. I was a kid, um, I was a child, not a kid, a kid is a goat. I was a child attending a wedding in the Lions Hall with my parents in 1987. So therefore, I wildly guess that in the early 1990s, the Lions Hall was renovated to become the square in where Fushini is now. 
even though I'm referring to the midst of the apartheid years. The interesting thing is that the white and the colored communities did work together. They were separated, they were segregated, but peacefully. In 1978, my parents were involved in the bicentenary celebrations of our town, which was established in 1778. So among the dignitaries at the festival were Professor Chris Barnard and the state president B.J. Foster Nohals, with a few colored folks sitting next to him, like my family. I'm sure you, you know Shirley Harker, my aunt, um, her husband as well, Mike Harker, they were councillors in Plet at that time in the municipality. So them sitting next to B.J. Foster at the bicentenary celebrations of Plet. So yes, the communities did work together, that tells me. And Another little joke, maybe, maybe you can call it a joke or maybe you can call it serious. As a child growing up in the 1980s, my dad sent me once a month to the old Plett Primary School, which was behind the post office. I'm sure you know, um, just below Cornuti. Um, and I had to go and pay Mrs. Mary Matthews because she gave me private piano lessons. Um, I remember always ringing the bell on the wooden gate. My dad always, because my dad also being a teacher and my mom a teacher, so we would take off like in the morning, they'll, my dad would put me in the car and say, Lee, come, we're going to go, you must quickly go and pay Mrs. Matthews. So usually it was during interval. So usually a prefect would come and open the gate for me, usually a girl, so a little white girl, and I never saw white children where I went to school, obviously, um, because of the apartheid years in the 1980s. Usually she was very shy, and I was very shy. I'm not used to seeing white children. So I followed her very uncomfortably up the wooden stairs into the staff room. And then when I saw Mrs. Matthews, my teacher, Mary Matthews, then my heart would, then I'll feel comfortable. And she'll always say something and make me feel comfortable and happy. That's what happened once a month. I always went there, and I remember that. Um, and I also remember behaving, being on my best behavior when I was at the white school. I, I even walked dif differently up that staircase. Okay, yes. And this photograph, so now this school is in Main Street, it opened in 1942. So that building which you're seeing there is the Fushinis building, that's the school. So my granddad in front, with a suit on, and the others were his ground staff. So the others were the guys that were the cleaners and worked very for him. I think that's an amazing photograph. Um, that was in 1946. Let's go to the next slide. And yeah, a publication about my granddad after he died. Um, I think I'm gonna read it because you might not Everyone might not, able, might not be able to, to read all the finer print, especially Ruby in the back. <laughs> this multiracial school actually started in 1901, but in 1912, Mr. Dunn became the first colored principal. It was then known as the St. Peter's Mission School. Today, the building can still be seen opposite Mrs. Crawford's house near the sea. I just want to stop there. Um, Crawford Brunt, Mrs. Betty Crawford Brunt, she was the owner of the old rectory, which is now a hotel, because afterwards the Anglican Church Diocese sold the property privately, so the Crawford Brunts lived there. In 1942, the school moved to the main street in town. Okay, let's go on to this. So that's a little bit of the Dunn's history. My surname is Dunn. Um, I'm gonna go on to the Harker's history. That was the guy, uh, Captain Robert Charles Harker. Um, Harker retired as major in the British Army, but continued to use his rank as captain. He was moved to Plett in October 1823. Now it gets interesting. Now your ears can open up a bit. Captain Harker had an illegitimate son from an unidentified colored woman from Plett in 1825. Isn't it getting interesting now? 
I find it interesting firstly because the author Patricia Stora uses the word colored. And I find that interesting because 1825, I'm sure the word colored wasn't used then because the, the Population Registration Act was only drafted in 1850. No, no, sorry, in 1950, not in 1823. So, very interesting. When I look back at history, history is very interesting. Um, Captain Harker was a judge and a postmaster. A very well respected man in the whole of Plitt. So, this is a bit of my info. So, therefore, the scandal was kept un undercover. His illegitimate son was named Henry Adolphus Harker and was born on the 1st of October 1825 and was taken, ah, listen to this, even more interesting, was taken from his mother at birth to be raised by a white family, namely the Sinclair family, who was related to Captain Harker's wife, Maria. Interesting history. Interesting when you look at me and where I come from and how we have come about. Interesting. After his wife's death in 1834, then only Captain Harker took his so-called colored son and had him christened in George. Oh, maybe too embarrassed he and played for this little brown boy. He was christened in the Dutch Reformed Church and not in the Anglican Church where they belong. Interesting, you see, history. It's getting more interesting. So I can add some of my info free of charge to you. I think it's because of the embarrassment of having a colored son by somebody else. And my wife, you know. So his colored son, Henry Adolphus Harker, had a son with exactly the same name, Henry Adolphus Harker II. Now that's my great grandfather. Henry Adolphus Harker II is my great grandfather and was born in Pettenberg Bay, 1881. Um, yeah, his wife was um, Elizabeth Bertha de Rock. Um, she she didn't speak Afrikaans. She spoke Wurdeutsch, which is Dutch. Um, she then became Elizabeth Bertha Harker, my great-grandmother, the one who owned the property in Crescent Street below Zanzibar Parking. Um, my great-grandfather, Henry Adolphus Harker, had a fishing boat. He caught fish for a living. I was told how his wife would never sleep at night when he was out on sea. Many great mariners died in Plitz waters. There were many good gillies. The brothers Angus and Archie McCullum, who were speaking about them a little bit earlier now, uh, were some of Plitt's best gillies during the first half of the 20th century. They were men with no fear of the sea and could even predict the weather patterns. They, got, they earned up to 2 rand 50 a day or even up to 3 rand 50 a day, which was a lot of money then. Plus food, plus wine, as an optional extra, but to a colored ghillie, alcohol was not an option. It was a necessity to survive in those, in those rough seas, I think. Henry Adolphus Harker's eldest daughter is my grandmother Bertha, Bertha Harker, born 1905. The other Harker siblings, I don't think I'll go into that detail. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to email all this info anyway to the Plate Historical Society and you'll be able to read it afterwards in their bulletin and on the website. Um, so yeah, my granny was the eldest of, um, they were ten, ten siblings. Um, oh, oh, let me ju maybe just read it quickly. Bertha, my granny, property in Clue Street. Uh, uh, brother Cornelius, property in Purkis Split. Um, Poor is where Pitt Primary is now, but first it was a sports field and it, has, and it had a police office there as well. Dora, who lived where Zanzibar Lounge is, she was born 1909. Henry lived in Clove Street, Plate. Uh, Selina, 1913, she was born. Roland lived in Clove Street, Plate. Um, Alice, the one who moved to New York, born in 1917. Millicent, uh, got married Muslim, moved to Cape Town and got a new name, Maimuna. She was born in 1919. And Michael, the husband of Shirley Harker, born 1921. And the youngest one, Gwendolyn, the one who owned Albergo Backpackers. But by then, it was still a humble little dwelling, of course, long before it was there. She was born 1925. And the Harkers, 
Oplet were a very big and happy family. I didn't even know that they had cameras in those days. Surely they did. The day when the two historic Plet families became one, the Harker and Dunn families. That has also been published in the, um, in the Heritage magazine, that's why I'd like you to take one. And yeah, I couldn't get a very clear photograph of my grandmother, how old she was at that time when she got married, but that's the best I could do. But my grandfather, you know those years with his Hitler, his Hitler look? Yeah, that, that's, how they, that's how they looked. And this was the newspaper article, Wedding Bells in Pittsburgh Bay. Um, yeah, there they got married. And that's where the two families got together, Harker and Dunn. The wedding was on the 27th of June, 1934, at the St. Chad's, um, St. Chad's Church in Harkerville. It's still there at the moment. Michael William Dunn, my grandfather, and Bertha Dinah Harker, my grandmother, got married in St. Chad's Chapel on the 27th of June, 1934. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. I think I've shown you this one. And my granny, how proud. Your beautiful home in Clue Street, center of town, big hedge they had around the garden. Yeah, beautiful. My granddad built the house in 1937 and called it Victoria Cottage or Victorian <coughs> Cottage. It was plot number number 12 in Clue Street. We all know that plot number one in Clue Street is the old house shop. So my granny lived in plot number 12, Clue Street. It's on the other side of the road where the, the Melville Spa um, parking area is now. And part of the building, um, what, what's the building just, just um, above? Atmar Center, part of Atmar Center. The bottom part of Atmar Center was also part of my granny's property. So the property stretched all the way from the house behind FNB right up to Atmar Center. And the bottom part of Atmar Center, below Pep Stores, was also part of the Dunn's property. The first born, my dad, was born in 1938 in Clue Street in Clint. Um, and his brother Derek, 1944. There were only two children. So I don't know if they, if contraceptives were maybe, you know, available in 1944 already, because I could see the previous generation, it, it wasn't. <laughs> One of my granddad's students, I call her Mama Rachel, Rachel Sierras, but she was Rachel Kricha. She often tells me how far she had to walk from the church grounds near Puerkis, where they used to live, in the, and she used to walk there barefoot in the mornings. Um, Summer or winter, she used to walk early in the morning in the cold, barefoot, and her halfway stop was my grandfather's place in Clove Street, where my grandmother used to dry Rachel's wet feet in the morning with a towel, give her a cup of hot milk every morning before she would continue to walk to the little school down in Bull Street, down at the old rectory. So another long walk, um, which is quite a long walk downhill for a little child in the cold and wet weather. So. I'm fortunate that many people often speak to me and tell me what an amazing man my granddad was and my grandma and tell me these little things which I then write down and which I can share with you now. Um, that's my dad, Mac, um, and his younger brother, his baby brother, Derek, which was seven years younger than him, I think. 1938, 1944, yeah, I think seven years. So my dad, you can see there with his dog, and big, huge garden that's in Clove Street. Um, I'll also show you a picture of the foundation stone. What I wanted to say, which is not so important to this evening, is that my mom and I are the only original Duns living in Pletstone. Um, yes, here are white Duns. I've spoken to Hilary Dunn who lives in Butterdrift. There are other dance, and let me just share this joke, Hilary wouldn't mind, she's a good friend of mine. And I one day asked her, Hilary, I just wonder, where are you from and where's your husband from? Because I'm sure we're not related. 
And she told me, no, Lee, we're definitely not related because my husband is one of those real, and this is her in her words, those real, dirty, red-haired Scottish duns. <laughs> and I thought to myself, Hillary, if you know where I come from, you won't call him dirty. Because my grand, great, great, grandfather, Scottish, Zulu, and here we come from. So, so yeah, our other dance. I want to show you this. Uh, my aunt Shirley Harker had a talk at the Plet Historical Society in January 1993. Um, and this was presented to her. I'll tell you now what that is. Not that I want a gift, because I already have all the family heirlooms. That is the foundation stone of the Harker Residency. Um, I thought I wrote something more down about that. No, I didn't. That's the original foundation stone of the Harker Residency, the original Harker Residency of 1823, round about there, 1825, when uh, Captain Robert Charles Harker came to play. I think it's 1823. So that's the original um, cornerstone, which is in possession of our family at the moment. Um, Shirley Harker, I'm, I'm sure you know that she passed away last year, yeah, at the age of 90. So we do have all these family heir heirlooms. How blessed we are. Um, I'm going to talk to you now about the move, the 1969 move, when the school was moved from, of course now it's the Group Areas Act and everything, and the school was now not in Main Street anymore. They didn't want the noisy kids in Main Street anymore. You have to go now. So I spoke to a few people who were there, who were students at that time that the teachers and the children had to move from Main Street Plate to New Horizons. The one lady I spoke to was Myra Van um, Yeah. Let me read this, let me read this. I spoke to one of the students of my parents in 1969 at the time that they had to be moved from their school in Main Street to their school in New Horizons, namely Myra Van Vogel, now age 64. And she told me that the students had to walk all the way from the old school in Main Street all the way to New Horizons. And the teachers, like my mom and dad, they weren't buckies. They were being transported and the poor old kids had to walk all the way there. That's not even the worst, listen to this. Yeah, the school opened on the 1st of July, 1969, in New Horizons. When they arrived there, tired and exhausted of the long walk, I mean, for a little child to walk so far, it probably take them an hour or two to walk. The premises were covered with snakes stones, rocks, it was a terrible experience. They had to clean up and work at it for quite some time because the area used to be a dense forest. Um, just a little bit of extra info I want to throw to you. Um, the area, New Horizons, it was Ashley Farm. I'm sure you know that. Weldon Farm, where Weldon Kaya is now, Weldon Farm, and there was also Ashley Farm. So Ashley Farm was bought and they, they put the colored people there, and later they changed it to New Horizons, but it was Ashley Farm. Um, in 1961, Plett had a permanent population of less than 5,000 people. So I'm sure there were more snakes than people. <laughs> the first street lights in Plett were switched on on the 1st of December, 1964, at 8.30 a.m by Mayoress Kate Martin. But New Horizons Township only received electricity 15 years later in 1979. Interesting. And my mom says, my dad also, that the teachers remember how spitefully they decided to leave the lights on for a whole week <laughs> in that, that time. I think it's 1979, I say. I said, yeah, 1979. They left the lights on for everyone, everyone in your horizons to see this is our building and we, we are lit up. So that the whole community could see that the school was now lit up. Let's go to the next slide. The Clove Street home of the Duns had to be left. What a sad day indeed. Um, that copy there is the lawyer's letter to my grandmother Bertha dated the 10th of May, 1972, 
by Mayer and Martin Legal Office in Iceland. So, yeah. the Harker families lived together in Central Plate all the years, so when they had to be moved because of the National Group Areas Act, they decided to buy family plots in Ashley Farm, now known as New Horizons Township, and the, the Harkers then became the first residents to live in New Horizons from 1969. Uh, as I just told you, my grandmother only moved there in 1972. The very first house in New Horizons um, was the home of Robert and Mary Harker on the corner of Kierwum Road and Smakes, the fat boy, is the owner of that house at the moment. That was the first house in, um, in New Horizons. My mom, Joey, moved to Plett in 1964 from Mossel Bay where she grew up, met my dad and they got married almost 10 years later. Um, yeah, in Plett at that time, were no lootings, no riots, no burnings. That's what I was told. It was very peaceful. I, I can see a few nods. So sadly, but true. It, it was very peaceful. Yes, yes, they lived separately, but it was very peaceful. Um, another little bit of in, interesting info, might become more interesting now. Uh, there were no black families living in Plate. By the way, I use the word black, yet according to the 1950 Population Registration Act, our country only had four race groups, namely European, meaning white, African, meaning black, Asian, including Indian, and anything else was known to be colored, meaning mixed. Uh, Johannes Grootboom was a sidesman in the St. Peter's Anglican Church and his wife Margaret, a domestic maid. They were the first black family who moved to Plett in the early, early 1970s, late 1960s. Um, their children, my parents know their children. Uh, their daughter Justine's son is a pharmacist in clicks at Market Square at the moment. So what a beautiful and proud achievement for Plett. There was no Bosischaf except for the Grootboom's family living there. The next black family was the Skosana family who moved to Plett from the Transka in the Eastern Cape to come and be domestic workers in holiday homes. And there were no other colored families owning property in the Plett CBD except the Harker and Dunn families with the Harkers owning most of the land. George Langdown. Very interesting character. Remember I told you that my granny was forced to move in 1972 and most of the other colored people already were moved to New Horizons in 1968. George Langdown refused to move. So, believe me or not, and I didn't bring it with this evening because otherwise you would all have wanted to see it. So I'm keeping it at home. But I have the Sunday Times color magazine with the picture of George Langdown on the front cover. This is not the front cover, this is one of the inside um, stories. George Langdown refused to move and made Sunday Times headlines on the 11th of February, 1973. People were evicted from 1968 in the Plett CBD. My granny Bertha in 1972 and George Langdown was the last colored person in 1973. It says there, the last colored of Plettenberg Bay, yes, force, forceful removal. Yeah. He refused to move, so they forcefully moved him and they demolished his house. And that, that was now, um, that's where Langdown Street now is because this guy made national headlines. So that's why we call it National um, yeah, uh, Langdown Street. Um, you, you, you'll see the bulldozer going there and I have the article, yeah, there it starts off by saying, hell no, that was his words. When he saw the bulldozer coming and approaching his home and telling him, at that old age, you now have to be moved out of your home. Um, yeah, since then it was named Langdown Street. So that's why I'm, I'm leaving that there for you to have a look at. It's, it's very sad, very interesting. Um, yeah. Was he the artist? Oh, no, no. His son Amos is the famous South African artist. Yes. Thank you for the question. George Langdown was the dad. 
So his, his um, son is a famous national South African artist, Amos Langdon. Ruby, there were no Indian people living in Plate in the 1960s, <laughs> except Topa Reddy. He came to Plate as one of the constructors of the new Beacon Island Hotel, which was then designed by world-class architect Professor Helmut Hendrich of Dusseldorf in West Germany and opened in 1972. But if you ask the colored folk of, who lived here in 1972, like George Langdown, what that new modern hotel looked like, you'll hear that George Langdown says in, in that article, he says the following, that hotel looks out of place here in our bay. It looks like nothing but a huge ship that's been stranded on the rocks. I wish to say the same about that ugly, huge court building that they built in your eyes. Yes. 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 Well, still I have a lot of close contact with Topa Reddy's son, Stanley Reddy. Um, he's now 60 in Johannesburg, and those are the people that we usually go and visit and stay over when we visit Johannesburg. Good contacts that you make in a small town like Plint. Um, during that year, Joe Moodley, I'm not sure if any of you might know Joe Moodley. He's the old gentleman who still works at Beacon Island Hotel right now. He was, he was Saul Kersner's first head porter of the Beacon Island Hotel. That's amazing. Thanks, Mr. Hawking. I'm going to repeat that if anyone didn't hear that. Joe Moodley was Saul Kersner's first head porter at the new Beacon Island Hotel. 1972. That's perfectly correct. 1972, and Joe is still living in Plant. Yeah. Still working there. Still working there and still living in Plant. Yes, yes. The other colored families in Plant all lived in Kierbums River, which was called Bito. Bito was the area that stretched all the way down from Old Nick down to Vitadrift. I think the um, De Jong family used to live there. That area used to be called Bito. So there was lots of colored family there. The colored folk also lived in the Redbone area. Um, and of course, the Griqua people, led up by um, AAS Lefleur, they moved here in 1920 already. So they, they were here long before the rest of the colored people <coughs> that I'm talking about right now. Um, in the cracks, there were very interesting colored people li living. And they called themselves the Busters. I'm going to tell you something interesting about the busters now. According to this book that I showed you now, uh, Bastards or Humans, according to that book, Dr. Ruben Richards says, a buster is an unwanted misfit, according to the dictionary. In Namibia, you get the real goth busters, and they're very proud of themselves. They, 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 they're a very proud nation. I mean, we have to be proud. I'm proud. You're proud of, of who you are and where you come from. The real Bath Busters, they call themselves the real Bath Busters, and they live in um, Namibia. So they are half German and half colored. So they're Busters. They're mixed. The, the Busters families who lived in the crags, um, I wanted to mention a few of the family names, but I think let me not do so. Let me rather not do so. Um, you know, it, it, it might be a sensitive issue for people. Because in those days of the apartheid years, the colored people saw the busters as colored people who were light-skinned and who wanted to be white for special privileges. So that's why I will not mention anything. Um, the following were the most well-known colored families in Plint, apart from George Langdown that I mentioned now, and the Harker families. The Windvogels, they lived in Gaansvlei, which is Goose Valley area. The McLeans, McCallums, you know those Gillies, the McCallums, um, Kamfers, Plykis, Brainers, Figeland families, they came from Bito area. The Bernardos lived in the crags, and the Windvogels also lived in Vitadrift. There was lots of Windvogels. This still is, it's true. <laughs> when I went to school, in the, the little school, the old Formosa Primary School, before they demolished that school, um, the teachers used to have a joke and say that in every class there's a Vinfogel. Because, you know, you, you, you do your, your, your um, um, alphabetical lists, so it will be grade 1A, grade 1B, grade 1C, grade 1D, all those, 
all the grade one class, every class would have four classes. Then every grade two, every grade three, every grade four, that's how it went up to grade seven. They are big fans. <laughs> Um, all those who now res res reside in New Horizons who are not the, the people coming in from other places, because of course there's lots coming in to Plet from other places, but those who are the original colored families, um, they mostly lived on the St. Peter's Anglican Church grounds in Plet um, before the, the move. And that's also where George Langdown lived. It, it was um, St. Peter's Anglican Church ground that gave grounds to the people to live on. St. Peter's ground spread all the way from Church Street, which is that side of town, right down to Puerkis. So the church had a lot of ground that time. The Bell Arch, erected in 1964 in memory of my granddad, Michael William Dunn. Okay, so, so let's just, so I'm not going to read all of that, but that's at the St. Peter's Anglican Church, and that's me standing there. That's me when I was apparently two years old, they say. That's what I hear. I don't know about that, because I couldn't remember that far. You weren't tall enough to reach the bell rope. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm sure I would have. Found a way. Yeah. Um, most of the colored people were fishermen, a gillies. A ghillie would carry your fishing gear and help with a bait, etc. There were also carpenters, builders, and their wives were mostly domestic workers. And later, very few of them became teachers, nurses, and police officers. All the shop assistants, interesting info, in Plet, were white people. The top positions in Plet for white people in the apartheid years were the following. They worked in butcheries, they were weighing the meat. Our times have changed. And, and that's first hand info that I got from my, my parents and my grandparents. Those days they had to weigh the sugar, weigh the rice, weigh the flour, even weigh the tomatoes, my mom says. Nothing was pre-packed. It was weighed, put in a paper bag, and sealed with an envelope, with, an, with, with sellotape. Very in environmentally friendly. Absolutely. I wonder who invented no plastic. that rubbish, yes, <laughs> that plastic shopping bag. And the colored people, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> the colored people had to call the white shop assistants Miss and Boss. Isn't it interesting? <laughs> miss meaning Miss and Boss meaning Boss. To those of you who cannot understand um, Afrikaans Miss and Boss too well, um, isn't that ironic? Because the one who serves is actually the servant but it has to be called bass. So it's not their fault. It's what the system made it to be at that time. I find it very ironic. Um, nowadays, you don't really see a white shop assistant. Could be a floor manager, perhaps, but our time has changed. The first public buildings in New Horizons, Theodora Kresh, was opened and donated by <coughs> Dr. Andrew Roberts. To any of you, are any of you old enough to remember who Dr. Roberts is? Or am I the only one who's born in Plet? Andrew. Yes, Andrew and Sally Roberts. Um, oh, close to where we are. Close to the Kerums River where they have the down-to-earth restaurant. Used to be the Mermaid Slipper, used to be many other names. But, but that used to be the, the property of Dr. Andrew Roberts and his wife Sally Roberts. I was a little boy um, and we had to go and sing and dance there once a year. Um, we, we sang Christmas carols, so we had to go and do our little thing and you know, <laughs> sing Christmas carols for Dr. Roberts because we would get a huge donation for the crash once a year if we went and performed at the house. So, so they started the Dora crash, which Shirley Harker was the, the principal for many years. Um, do any of you remember Dr. Roberts' daughter, um, Dinah Apple? Dina, Dina, yeah, yeah. I also know her very well. Yeah, because the Robertses are not here anymore. But yes. Theodora Crash opened its doors on the first of August, nineteen sixty eight. And my aunt Shirley Harker was appointed the principal. Um, Formosa Primary School opened on the first of july nineteen sixty nine. And when my grandfather Michael William Dunn died, Reginald Carollison, the husband of Dora Harker, became the principal. You know, it it sounds strange, it sounds like the Harkers Everything was just them. 
you know, when, when, you, when you look back at the history, but that's how it was. At that time, New Horizons had no shop, no church, just a few private homes. They had church in a classroom in the school. Um, yeah, after the move, so this is my granny's house in um, how it looks at the moment in New Horizons. Um, you know, after the move, everyone had to be moved and had property and built houses and whatever. And the one on the picture is my grandmother's youngest son, Derek, my dad's youngest brother, Derek, when he came and had, wanted to come and see the house. Of, uh, of course, you can't see the other house because I'll tell you now that the other house was demolished, as you all know. It was demolished to build the shop, the Melville Spa um, parking area. How stupid. Yeah, okay, let's, let's not go there. Okay, let's stop there. Demolishing the 1937 Dunn family home to build a parking area in Kloof Street in 2002. If you look at the colorful picture, you'll clearly see Atmar Center, and you'll see how close my granny's house was to Atmar Center, right there, and they demolished all of that. And this is the article that was published, Victorian Cottage, uh, Victorian Cottage Demolished. How sad. That made news headlines, seeing that my granddad built the house in 1937. Then Victoria Cottage became the first publicity and tourism bureau in 1991. Um, and the Alhambra tree that was planted on that property from 1881, when the plots were demarcated in the Pled CBD, also had to be uprooted then. When they, when they demolished that house, the mayor then was Ewan Wildeman, and he told my dad that um, we would be paid out a land claim. We did not get a cent from Bitter Municipality or from anyone. So, yeah, lip service, you and Voldemar, thank you very much. At least my dad felt good about it, hearing good news. <laughs> um, yeah. There were many sanctions against our country at that time. It's very sad. Um, at the opening of Afrodox last week that I attended, um, Maria Makeba herself, who is a South African citizen, encouraged the UN to implement sanctions against South Africa, and how she only moved back from Belgium after my diva's release in 1990. It's, it's sad how people were really, if I may say it, kicked out of their place of, you know, where they, where they lived, and how only later they, yeah, it's, it's really sad when you think about it. Um, and yeah, the sanctions and the sanctions, you know, in the apartheid years, the beauty pageants were huge things. You all know Miss South Africa, and Miss South Africa always had to be white, blonde, with blue eyes. I mean, we all know it, we all looked, I was little and I always saw the beautiful girls in the Sunday Times, all of that. And then my cousin Amy, also from the Harker's side, um, she became the first, yeah, l let me read what's standing there. My cousin Amy made history the first ever colored Miss South African crown in 1992. So at the time when the sanctions were now removed, I think they probably, um, this is my, my little bit of info, I don't think it is so. I'm not saying Amy shouldn't have won that year, I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is I'm sure there was a lot of pressure. You had to put a colored person in. You had, you had to put someone else in, otherwise we wouldn't, you know, so Amy was very, uh, you know, so beautiful cousin of mine. I told you Zulu and Scottish blood makes a beautiful mixture. <laughs> um, yeah, the interesting thing is I do have relatives all over the world um, because the sad thing is that in the 1970s many of the more affluent colored people who could left the country. Many were stuck. Uh, I remember my uncle, um, Uncle Richard, in Cape Town, he was the last who still left in the 1980s. We still went to go say goodbye to him, and they, they moved in Can they moved to Canada. Um, those are his daughters that came and visited Pled last year to come and see the old rectory hotel. Uh, my aunt, Dulcie, in Brisbane, in Australia, that was my first international trip during a school holiday. It's sad, you know, that people had to leave their country. I remember when Auntie Dulcie and them, they, they lived in PE, and how they shipped all their all the furniture, everything, they shipped to Australia in the 1970s. 
and my two cousins whom I knew very well, Jody and Odette, we played with them when we were little, they over there. So when I visited Australia, I could speak with Jody, with Odette, with Auntie Dalsy and with Uncle Ian, because they still have the South African English accent. But their youngest son, Chad, my youngest cousin in Australia, was born in Australia. So he has the very heavy Australian English accent. It took my ear a day to adjust <laughs> before I could communicate with my own cousin a day later, and that's the truth. Yeah, so, yeah. So, yes, the interesting thing is that apartheid did a lot of bad, but is to me also good, because if it wasn't for that apartheid government, I wouldn't have had relatives all over the world. I was in Germany and Austria this year, um, for my aunt's 80th. It was a surprise birthday party. We were in Germany and Austria. There I am with the Alps, uncle, aunt, you can see. Um, yeah. And you can see by the picture, we, we're all colored. And we family and we love traveling and we go visit, you know. So her 80th, we went over there uh, for that. Yeah. I want to talk to you a little bit about the land claims. The Harkers of Plenty Unite. The interesting thing about the land claims is that my family did get something out um, later through the land claims. My granny received, my granny Bertha received 19,000 rand. I want to mention this to you tonight. I mean, we open here tonight. This is a talk. We open. She received 19,000 rand for a property in Clue Street which was worth millions. She received 19,000 rand. Um, further, the government gave each one of the Harker and Dunn families an amount of 30,000 rand for the properties worth far more than millions of rands. There is simply no comparison. I remember when my dad got his 30,000 rand and had to give half to his brother Derek in Johannesburg. Uncle Derek has three children, so now he gets half of the 30,000 rand, he gets 15,000 rand, and each one of his three children probably wants to have 5,000 rand. So what does he have? Zero. For all his millions property worth has nothing, you know. So yet the family still looks back with beautiful memories and gratefulness. Um, and I think I owe that to my dad because I didn't grow up in a family that was racist. I never grew up with a family where, you know, because many people were. I have to admit that. Many people did say, don't talk to a white person or don't do that, don't do that, or whatever. My dad was not like that. He, he loved everyone and he was loved by everyone. My, my dad passed away. Um, yeah, so, so I grew up in a family where that was installed inside of me, and that is who I am at the moment. Um, I'm going to mention a few little things to you as well. Our departed years in Plek does not only have bad memories, but also good memories to many of the colored people. As I told you now, there were now really roughness, and they lived peaceful. Um, yeah, they, they lived peaceful with one another. My dad was born in Plet in 1938, as I told you, and had many white friends, because I think that was also before the time of the, the Group Areas Act. Um, you do know Mrs. Mari Monk, who lives in High Street in Plet. She was one of my dad's friends as well. I don't know why my dad always re remembered the girls, the girlfriends, <laughs> and never the boys. But anyway, um, yes, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and he used to love your your sister-in-law, Joan, Joan van Rensburg. So, you know, and that's why I say that the good thing about me growing up in a family like that, my parents instilled that inside of me. And not the other side which you see, the negativity, the hatred, the, the unhappiness. My dad, and even during the apartheid years, I remember when we always used to go do shopping. We went to the old spa, we went, we went with mom and dad, whatever, and the respect that my parents were treated with, it said a lot to me even during those times. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, I, re I remember one little story as well where my dad was asked by a white gentleman to help him carry a box into a whites only section of a shop. And my dad refused. And my dad laughed about it because either in, in the older part of years, you had, the colored people had to 
do their shopping through a window, apparently. If there wasn't a separate door, they, they used to buy through the window. <laughs> Interesting, you know? And so this day, you, you, need, you need someone to help you, you need some muscles. So my dad said, I'm very sorry, you carry, you carry your own box. So, so yeah, in, interesting things, you know, that a person hears about it. Um, my, my dad laughed a lot when he told me about these things. And to me, who did not grow up during those times, it sounds like total madness. Let me quote to you from page 76 of the book, Cry the Beloved Country by Alan Payton. The book that was written in London in September 1948 and been banned in South Africa because of apartheid. Alan Payton says the following. There's no time to talk of hedges and fields or the beauties of our country. Cry, our beloved country. Cry for the broken tribe. Cry for the law and the custom. Cry for the man who is killed for the women and children bereaved. Cry the beloved country, because these things are not yet at an end. The sun pours down on the earth, on our lovely land that man cannot enjoy. There are voices crying, what must be done? A hundred, a thousand voices, but what do they help? If one seeks for counsel, for one cries for this, one cries for that, and another cries for something which is neither this nor that. As I mentioned, many of the light-skinned colored people like my grandmother Bertha were offered two ID documents, two IDs. So my grandmother could choose to be European on her one ID and she was colored on the other. How stupid, how, how absurd. Um, and that was in accordance with the Population Registration Act of 1950. Um, yeah, on her one ID, she was white and could get special privileges. But then the family had to wait outside. So, so my granny said, what would it help if she had to go in by the main door and do shopping and her family had to wait outside? So she refused. She, she refused the special privileges. And of course, her other ID was colored. Well, my granny was also offered a renewable permit to remain in her house in Clue Street because of a, skin, uh, a light skin color, whereas the other colored folk were not allowed a permit. But my granny refused out of loyalty to the rest of her family. She said no, so she left her home as well. But she was offered a permit. She, she refused. Um, yeah. I'm just going to mention something that I did mention in a previous <coughs> historical society meeting about Bossi Schiff as well. Uh, many people want to know where the word Bosischaf came about. And I was told that it was called Bishop's Gift because the Anglican church grounds. So it was called Bishop's Gift. And the colored and black people who lived there couldn't pronounce it correctly. <laughs> and eventually it becomes, what do you call it, a slang word or whatever. And it's Bosischaf. Today it's Bosischaf. <laughs> Now, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to do a few thank yous. <coughs> Before I end my speech, I'm going to do a, I'm going to, let's, let's do it different. Otherwise, if I leave the thank yous for last, you're all going to be out the door already. I'm going to do a few thank yous. I'm going to call one or two people forward, if you don't mind. And then I'm going to do the conclusion of my speech and leave a moment for a question or two. I would like Mike and Leslie to please come forward and come and stand next to me. Thank you for this amazing opportunity um, granted to me by the Plate Historical Society, Leslie. Um, I also want to tell you that Leslie was overseas and she made sure to come back to Plate for my talk. I feel very honored. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have something for you. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. That's yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been such an honor to have you speaking, and we are delighted. No, we're not delighted with what you've told us because it's very painful, clearly. But we are delighted that you've been having the opportunity to speak to us and uh, give us a little nudge to give some further thought. 
as to the situation that you've all been through. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Um, I'm actually been asked by Clive to say thank you to Lee. But he hasn't finished. I know. Um, but yeah, I thought I'd give it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're doing it yes. our way. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to thank uh, Clive asked me to thank. I thought it'd be a good opportunity so we can leave the rest of the of the evening free for questions and on, and even statements if people have statements. So that's also good. Lee, um, there's very little I can say after that presentation except thank you so much from my heart. Um, I can say though, uh, from our side, that I, I kind of understand what you mean about mixed descent because my actual classification is a Buddha Yuat. I have, uh, <laughs> I have Afrikaans speaking ancestors on my mother's side and I have uh, a lot of Jewish folk from Eastern Europe and Central Europe on my dad's side. Um, and my mother was christened Dutch Reformed. She was confirmed Anglican in Grahamstown and married a Jew and converted to Judaism. <laughs> <laughs> and I was doing research into my own ancestry and I discovered a, a lady on my mother's side called Diana of Malagasy. So I'm going to have myself reclassify this colour and get 50% BE points. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Darren, you're looking at me from behind the lens. I want you here by me. I want to show everyone who Darren chats is. So if they need wedding, wedding, you know some wedding photography. Oh, you don't do weddings. Thank you, brother. Thanks, Darren. Thank you so much. Oh, did you grab yours? Oh, did you grab yours? Sorry, sorry, sorry. You no, 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 you already have yours. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I just want to make like, 100% sure. Um, Lynette, can you please join me here? This is Lynette from the um, Show Me Pettenberg Bay website. So, what? I think Lynette was standing in front of the... Because the problem is going to hide her way. Um, so, she's going to do a lot of, and has done a lot of advertising as well for what we are doing and for the good work that Pet is sorry for that. The Van Pettenberg Historical Society is doing. And they thank you very much. It'll be a pleasure as well for me. Leon? Swart? Can you please come and join me here? Very good friend of mine, Leon. Thank you, Leon. You're welcome. I have one more person to go for it. Um, Ruby, I just wanted to ask you something, please. Can you please come forward with Ruby? I wanted to ask you something. Did the Ruby run away? <laughs> I don't know Ruby to have stage fright. So I don't know Ruby to run away. If Ruby has run away, this. She can't run away. Thank you very much. And can you please stand here next to me? Um, Ruby has brought these two flowers, and I have two um, colorful people here today. Can you remember they, they said I'm a colorful man when I started my speech? I have two colorful people here today that I'd like to call forward to join Ruby and I here. Um, the one is my mom. Thank you for all the info and support. And the other person I'd like to call forward is also a colorful person. Lelani, can you please come and stand in front of me? Are you with me? Lelani, it's her birthday today. She sacrificed her time and her birthday parties with friends to be here to support me. Lelani Langdown is a direct descendant of George Langdown. 
I'd also like to have a pick with, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit full of nonsense. So my directors now. I'd like to have a pick with the entire Rotary Club, with Ruby and the entire Rotary Club. I'll, I'll bring them forward. I'll, I'll forcefully remove them from their comfortable seats in the background, and I'll put them in the forefront where they, where they are supposed to be. So, so let's, let's also just give a hand to the Rotaries. The other person I wanted to thank is from Pet Tourism and they couldn't make it here this evening. In conclusion, before I open myself up for one or two questions. In conclusion, I firmly believe that what our political leaders are endorsing currently, namely, the expropriation of land without compensation is totally wrong. Yeah, yeah. Whether it was done under law or under the group areas or whether it's done in a way that it's being done in our country at this moment in time, it still remains wrong. Even according to world constitutions and according to world religious scriptures, it still remains wrong to take something which does not belong to you. Let us as a united and unified plate stand up for what is right. Let us stand together as different communities and also stand as one. And let us continue to preserve what is ours and what many of our ancestors have worked hard for. Not through toy toying, not through strikes, not through riots, through damaging or breaking, but by proudly building up what is ours. And before I make my end statement, I would like to add something which Leon Swart mentioned to me yesterday after the book launch of this gentleman who wrote on the colored people of South Africa. Um, Dr. Reuben Richards, the writer of this book, is also a colored man, by the way. So, just in case you thought that he's a white man now calling the colored people, are they bastards or humans? He's a colored gentleman, um, Dr. Ruben Richards. And he says the following. The reason why the USA is so strong is because firstly, they are American. And secondly, they are Hispanic or Jewish or this or uh, African-American or whatever. First, they are American. And secondly, they are what they are. And that is the mistake we are making in our country. Because firstly, we are colored. I'm colored, I'm black, I can't be friends with you, I can't do this. I'm Christian, I'm Jewish, I'm Muslim, I'm this. Firstly, we should be South African. Yeah, yeah. And secondly, this. So let's learn that from the American. <laughs> Thank you to the wise words of Dr. Ruben Richards from Cape Town, which he shared with us yesterday. And I end with a quotation from page 261 of Cry the Beloved Country. And I'm even becoming emotional. Thank you for that anyway. <laughs> And now for all the people of South Africa, our beloved country, Nkosi Sikilele in Africa, God save and bless Africa, that men would walk upright in the land where they were born and be free to use the fruits of the earth. What was the evil in it? Yet men were afraid with a fear that was deep, deep in the heart, a fear so deep that it hid their kindness or brought it out with fierceness and anger and hid it behind fierce and frowning eyes. And such fear could only be cast away. <laughs> Sorry. 
and such fear could only be cast away except by love. Thank you very much. This is my name. Thank you, Miriam. I would like to thank you for a, um, being such a cooperative audience this evening. From us of the uh, historical society, I can only say fantastic. Uh, really fantastic.